Famine and hunger can quickly lead to conflict, an issue all the more pressing in the face of a changing climate. Joining us now for more on the role Canada might play to mitigate these problems, in Guelph, Ontario via Skype, there's Evan Fraser, Professor of Geography at the University of Guelph. And Evan, it's good to have you back on TVO tonight. How's it going? I'm doing great. Thanks very much for having me, Steve. Not at all. It's good to have you back. As we look into the future and figure out how we, as your Twitter handle, at Feeding 9 Billion suggests how we're going to feed the world, talk to us just off the top, make a bit of a list of the major challenges that are out there that might prevent us from doing that. So a lot of experts in this field are worried that we're facing what they call a perfect storm of problems, meaning over the next generation, population is likely to rise to between 9 and 10 billion people. At the same time, the farmers of the world are going to have to produce enough food for this growing number, but also contend with volatile energy prices, climate change, and political instability. So a lot of people think that if we fail to produce 70% more food, that's the most commonly quoted statistic, uh, the world will become, if we fail on that task, the world will become hungrier, more violent, and, and more disease-ridden. And climate change? Obviously, something that everybody is concerned about these days. If that transpires the way scientists, the vast majority of them, project, what does that look like in terms of food production? Well, the, the, there's a huge range of debate on, on that particular topic. It depends where in the world you're talking about. It depends for what crops you're talking about. But if you're talking sort of at a global level about cereal crops, the expectation is that climate change will cause something like a 2 or 3% decline in yields over the next, each decade over the next um, uh, 100 years, which adds to, the, adds to the problem, adds to this idea of a perfect storm that as we're re trying to meet the demands of the growing human population, we're also going to have to contend with the fact that food is harder and more expensive to produce. Although presumably in some places where you have an infelicitous climate right now, you might be able to do some kinds of growing that you couldn't do. Yeah, that's, that's the good news story. At least that's what the optimistic scenario would hopefully uh, lead us towards, and that places like Canada might experience an increase in its, say, its, its, its growing season. It would get more heat units. Uh, in other words, there'd be a little bit warmer, there'd be a little more sunshine. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real guessing game as to whether that, that is even going to happen. I mean, let's, let's hope it does, but, but what that doesn't take into account of is how pests or insects may change their distribution in response to these changing uh, weather patterns. Also, it doesn't really talk much about whether water is available. So, so it's, a, it's a real guessing game as to whether or not um, we benefit or what parts of the world benefit from this. So let's go with your first premise then, that uh, food production dips, that there will be more food shortages around the world. Based on your experience looking at food shortages that take place now, what happens to countries where that transpires? Well, it's, it's really interesting. We, when we think about this, we have to avoid the sort of simplistic argument that, uh, that hunger breeds conflict and desperation. So the old Bob Marley quote is, a hungry man is an angry man. And, and with all respect to Bob Marley, uh, I don't think that's quite right. Often what we see happening in cases, say, is, as widespread as the French Revolution or even the Rwandan genocide, what we see are, are crop failures causing uh, the rural economies to decline. And this creates a, a reason or becomes one of many reasons that people say migrate to cities. They're ill-equipped without the infrastructure. And in these ill-equipped, uh, economically deprived cities, then people start coming in conflict or in contact with each other, say for the first time between rival groups. They become exposed to eth uh, political corruption or, or inequality. And, and it's in that context of political inequality and corruption that then food protests start emerging protests then start perhaps spreading. Um, so we know, for instance, that, that the French Revolution started on the heels of El Nino-induced crop failures that brought people into Paris where they started protesting food prices. We've got lots of other examples like that throughout history. Okay, that's 1789. Let me bring you to you know, present day, which is, as you look around the world today, do you see any countries that are in the midst of either um, great tension or even war prompted by food insecurity? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and, and increasingly climate scientists are, are 
pointing out that Syria had a, a huge drought between 2006 and 2009. And the climate modelers that, that are, have been looking at this have, e have even speculated that this drought was directly caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So it was caused by climate change. And that, again, so undermined those rural economies that farmers left their land and moved into the cities where they became exposed to political corruption and, and ethnic tensions and whatnot, and, and, and things quickly escalated. So there is an argument that the Syrian civil war is directly comes out of an environmental crisis. It wasn't caused by the crisis, but that environmental crisis helped catalyze the series of events that lead up to the civil war. So we may, you can tell me correctly or incorrectly, but we may think here in Canada that we are a relatively rich country and we are relatively isolated uh, from a lot of these goings on that you've described in the world. Do you think as a result that we are removed from food insecurity problems, generally speaking? So there's, there's sort of three answers to that question. The first is we are extraordinarily lucky that, that in Canada we're going to be able to ride out the 21st century in a, popul in a country that has a small population, a high degree of technological sophistication, and abundant land. So, so that, that really favors us. On, on the other side of the coin, we have to acknowledge the fact that the events on the other sides of the planet draw us in. We are engaged militarily in the Syrian crisis. Uh, we are morally responsible for helping out those in need. And, and well, part of the last election was, was fought on the basis of our moral responsibility to the refugee crisis. So there's no way that we can avoid the, the, the nature of these global systems that are, that are causing so much stress and upheaval in different parts of the world. And those bring it home to us. In which case, let me ask what must sound like a simplistic question, but is the answer to the problem of climate change affecting our yields simply for us to grow more food? Well, here, the, here we have one of the, the, the horrible, depressing ironies of the 21st century. We say we need to produce more food to feed 9 billion people, and, and to a certain extent that's true, but we also have to acknowledge that today we do produce enough food to feed us all. There's actually 2,850 calories per person per day on the planet, so that's, that's more than enough for us all to eat well. We also waste a third of our food, and yet 1.3 billion people are either overweight or obese, and about 800 million are chronically malnourished. So simply producing more food won't help anybody. Uh, what we need to do, I think, is is to think about food security at a global scale as as requiring four different parts of a portfolio. And the first part is we need to invest in science to help us produce production. But that's not just simply creating miracle seeds and exporting them around the world. And scientists like, like me and, and my colleagues at the University of Guelph, we have to be working in participatory ways with farmers in the developing world to identify local co problems and help them boost their yields. Uh, similarly, the second part of the strategy has to be to store more food as a buffer against a crisis. And, and really, we've adopted a just enough, just in time approach to food systems. We don't store very much. And that has to change because it creates a high degree of, of brittleness. Third, thirdly, <clears throat> Thirdly, we need to be investing and supporting local food systems, particularly in the developing world where people are so disempowered by global corporate structures. We, we need to be giving a certain amount of effort to local food systems, not because they're going to feed all of us all the time, but because they represent a line of defense that protects particularly urban consumers against the vagaries of the international market. And, and fourth and finally, we need a policy regime or a policy uh, context that puts a value on the environmental and social costs of food production. We'll never get a sustainable system until we start paying, for instance, for the cost of car the carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted by our food system. So we need policies to correct those, those situations where the market fails to adequately account for the full cost of our food production. So those are the four basic pillars I would, I would say we need to be embarking on. And it's not a one or the other, it's, it's a portfolio that we need. In which case, let me take you through the four pillars of your plan there, and let's go through them one by one, and uh, perhaps I can uh, get you to just sort of amplify a bit on each one. Uh, increased efforts among science to boost production. What does that look like? Well, I think what it means is that we have to, scientists have to be working with farmers particularly in the developing world where their yields are very low. So large parts of Africa, for instance, only produce about 10% of what they theoretically could. And this represents a yield gap, which, uh, and closing that yield gap is a, is a scientific and engineering priority of, of the utmost importance. But, it, but we have to be 
closing that yield gap using locally appropriate tools developed in partnership using participatory ways with farmers. So for, for instance, a, a friend of mine does a lot of work in Nepal, but instead of saying, here's the technology you need, he says, right, can we together workshop through um, the problems that you face to help boost your your yields? So he entered Nepal thinking that uh, that some uh, biotechnologies were going to help close the yield gap in Nepal. And, and through workshops, they devised what they called a sustainable um, agricultural kit, which involved two sticks and a string to be able to mark a line in the, in the field, and, and essentially a very primitive seed planter, which looked essentially like a straw, a waist-high straw, so it was easy for farmers to plant in rows without having to bend down all the time. And this, these two sticks and a string to mark the line and the straw to drop the seed in helped increase yields by approximately 50%. And it's that kind of hmm. locally appropriate technology that we really need. Okay, let's go to pillar number two, which is to store more in order to buffer against the tougher times. Question, uh, who stores it? Where do they store it? How do they store it? <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that's a superb question. In, in the 1970s and 80s and into the 90s, the United Nations created what they called the Strategic Grain Reserve in Africa. Um, and the United Nations essentially paid for the silos and then the individual governments were supposed to be responsible for keeping the silos filled. The system, for a whole bunch of reasons, didn't work very well. It was expensive. The food went bad. Um, so the, the, the United Nations has moved away from sort of a wholesale food grain storage process to a much more targeted targeted approach where food stores are given to, are created amongst the community uh, at a very local level in highly vulnerable areas to act as a, a buffer. Um, similarly, we can do a lot of stuff at the household level. Uh, and and it, it see, seeing a series of, of cascading levels from the household up to the community through to the region up to the nat the nation. We can identify key areas where food can be stored, but really it's at the bottom end of that, the household and the community level where, where food stores tend to be the most effective. All right. Your third pillar is invest and support local food systems. Um, I would have thought we're doing a lot of that already, are we not? So in the in the developing world, we're, 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 we're doing a fair bit in terms of supporting farmers markets and, and protecting farmland, say, through the, the Green Belt Act or the, or the recent Ontario Local Food Act, which creates um, uh, uh, targets for, for hospitals and universities and other public institutions to buy local. I, I think that's a, those are all great starts, and, and that's the sort of process that we need to be seeing uh, rolled out at a, at a much more ambitious level. What we, we have to realize is that the local farms, they may not be as economically efficient and provide consumers with the same low-cost food that the global system ca ha can, can produce. But, but the local food system, like I said, acts as a buffer against the um, uh, vagaries of the international market. And then local food, if it's properly managed, should also provide all sorts of non-market benefits. It should reconnect consumers and, and, and farmers. It should have environmental benefits. So there's all sorts of good reasons why at the local level we can, we can be better supporting things. And that means uh, consumers deciding to direct some of their buying habits, more of their buying habits towards local food, as well as policies like we see emerging in the last 10 years in Ontario. And your fourth and final pillar, uh, a better understanding of the environmental and social costs of putting as much CO2 into the atmosphere as we're doing. Do I infer from that that you think we need something like a cap and trade or a carbon tax system or something like that in place to give us a better appreciation of those costs? Yeah, I, the short answer to that question is, is yes. Uh, the, the market is supposed to give present a consumer with a, a, a choice between various options where the cost reflects the cost of producing that product. And at the moment, our food system does not actually present us with the true cost, uh, the true cost to the earth, the true cost to, to, to humanity of producing food. And I, I came face to face with, with this in, in, a, in the most dramatic way, uh, visiting a feedlot in, in the US. It's a feedlot that had 100,000 cows that were being produced for beef, product, uh, for beef. And at the back of the feedlot was a 410,000 ton pile of manure, which is a v enormous public health nightmare. And no one was paying for the cost of that manure to be cleaned up. So our system is broken in the sense that it fails to accurately reflect the costs of production and pass those costs on to consumers. And that means that policy has to step in and correct what economists would call this market failure, a situation where the market fails to do its job. And that could be a cap and trade system or a carbon tax. Uh, we could debate the nuances of the specific policies, but we need to be moving towards a policy regime that reflects and captures these hidden costs. It is, uh, I think, Evan, of course, the job of politicians to implement the policies that you've just described.
and uh, let me put the landscape out there for you. We have a Premier in Ontario right now who used to be, for a while, the Agriculture Minister of this province as well. So theoretically, she knows these issues. We have a new government federally now, which uh, certainly in its early days is talking a very good game about a, a heightened sensitivity to climate change, environmental degradation, and the like. Does that suggest that we're heading in the right direction? Oh, I'm, I'm delighted, to be honest. Uh, with 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 all of this and and i hope that um that uh that the the provincial government is is able to make the local food act more robust is able to to um uh, tighten up on on the green belt and, and and all of those sort of things and and boy i hope that um that our new prime minister and the premiers are able to go to the the climate change summit in paris later this month and and produce a, a compelling set of policies which will will help us tackle this this massive issue and it's an issue that in many ways is going to I think define the 21st century M much like uh, the Cold War or the civil rights movement are, are seen as defining challenges of the 20th century I, th I think developing the ways and means to ethically and sustainably robustly feed 9 billion people while while addressing climate change this is going to be one of the defining challenges of the next generation Evan we just interviewed Jeff Rubin the economist uh, who sees um who sees a possibility for agriculture in a way that that oil has, oil and gas have not happened. And in, in that respect, what he's saying is, we didn't become the oil and gas superpower that uh, former Prime Minister Harper hoped we would become, price of oil, of course, going down, being a, a big part of it. But with climate change, he believes, we have the opportunity to be an agricultural superpower, the likes of which we are not today. Now, I know you talked to us earlier about increased pests uh, lack of irrigation possibilities, uh, too many unknowns. But is it possible he's on to something with that prognostication? <laughs> so I, I'll come back to the fact that Canada is a uh, very large country with a huge land base with a relatively small population. So right away, we have the raw ingredients to produce a vast agricultural surplus that can be exported around the world. The, the second thing is we are extremely sophisticated technologically and we have phenomenal research facilities uh, all the way across the country for dealing with agricultural related, related work. So we should be at the vanguard of bringing about the next agricultural revolution. That said, I don't think it's a simple matter of just saying the world's getting warmer, the northern hemisphere is going to have a better growing season, therefore we're going to be able to produce a lot more food and export that to Africa. That, that, that sort of simplistic narrative I would, I, would be very, I, would, I would stay well away from. What I would say is that Canada, through research and technology development, can develop the tools to help adapt to climate change. Uh, we can play an increasingly central role in the global food system in terms of our exports, but we can also be much more ambitious about of our, our development agenda and, and work in participatory ways like my friend in, 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 in Nepal. We can work in, uh, on, on the development front with far small scale farmers in the developing world to help create a situation where they can solve their own problems. And by moving forward simultaneously on all those different fronts, I, I think we can become an agricultural superpower. But it's not simply a question of are we going to be exporting more prairie grain to Western Africa as it, as it burns away under a climate change scenario. That, that, I, that's too simplistic. Evan, we're literally down to our last 30 seconds here, so let me uh, ask you to be economical with this last uh, question and answer, and that is uh, two schools of thought. One, charity begins at home. Two, we have a moral obligation because of who we are in this world to feed the world. Uh, which side of the coin do you come down on more or less? <laughs> They're totally different issues. Canada has a acute food security problem, specifically amongst the First Nations, that's linked with poverty and infrastructure. That is a completely separate issue, no less important, but a completely separate issue than producing enough raw carbohydrates to meet the world's uh, growing population. And and both are extraordinarily important policy items that need to be worked on simultaneously. But if I read between your lines, um, you think we do have a moral obligation to feed the world too, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just making sure that you're the guy I thought you were. Okay. <laughs> Evan Fraser, University of Guelph, really good of you to join us uh, via Skype uh, from what looks like your office at the university tonight. It is indeed. Thanks, okay. Steve. Thanks so much, Evan. We'll talk to you again. Bye now. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.